Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're so glad you could be here. I'm Larissa, and I will be your reader today. We will join together and read Psalm 23 in unison. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Lord God, as we come before you in worship this day, keep us steadfast in your word. Defend us from temptation and give us your saving peace. In Jesus' name, Amen. As we worship today, we light this candle to remind us that Christ is present among us. And we worship in the name of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The Bible tells us, and we all know from our own lives, that the world doesn't work the way it is supposed to. It is broken. And this brokenness affects our relationships with God and each other. Unfortunately, we're unable to fix what is broken because we ourselves are broken. We call this brokenness sin. And as the Bible says, if we claim that we're free of sin, we're only fooling ourselves. On the other hand, if we admit our sins, God will forgive us. Once forgiven, our relationship with God is repaired, and the basis for repairing our relationships with each other is established. Let us spend a few moments together now and confess our sins and ask God to forgive us. Father in heaven, we are broken and need your help. We ask you to forgive whatever sins we have committed Guide us so that your forgiveness overcomes our broken lives. We pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. God is merciful, and so I say to you this day that your sins have been forgiven. To make sure that you know your sins are forgiven, God's own Son, Jesus Christ, gave up his life on the cross for you. So let go of the burdens that weigh you down, and give them to Jesus, and celebrate this new opportunity that God has given you. Amen. I 
sent him to die. I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul. Please join with me as we pray our prayer of the day. Almighty God, you have gathered your people together into the church, the body of Christ on earth. Give us the grace to live by faith so that we can truly do your work on earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Our first reading today comes from Philippians, chapter 4, verses 4 through 13. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. How I praise the Lord that you are concerned about me again. I know you have always been concerned for me, but you didn't have the chance to help me. Not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Word of God, word of life. Our second reading today comes from Isaiah. Chapter 25, verses 6 through 9. In Jerusalem, the Lord of Heaven's armies will spread the wonderful feast for all the people of the world. It will be a delicious banquet with clear, well-aged wine and choice meat. There he will remove the cloud of gloom, the shadow of death that hangs over the earth. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away all tears. He will remove forever all insults and mockery against his land and people. The Lord has spoken. In that day, the people will proclaim, This is our God. We trust in him, and he saved us. 
This is the Lord in whom we trusted. Let us rejoice in the salvation he brings. Word of God, word of life. We're in our second week now of looking at the life of Jacob. Last week, I looked at that pivotal moment when he wrestles this mysterious stranger, this angel, and he gets his name changed from Jacob to Israel. And so we're going to back up today, and we're actually going to look at the situation around his birth and the very little bit we know about his growing up and his youth. Now, one of the things we have to remember, this is absolutely pivotal, this all took place a really long time ago, somewhere between 3,800 and 4,000 years ago. The world back then was very different. The geography was basically the same. The, the animals were the same. But the space occupied by people was very different. People were always one bad harvest away from famine and starvation. They were one illness away from an entire village or even an entire culture being wiped out. Because they always lived on the edge, they were just surviving. The cultures, the societies, they developed very strict rules on how to live. There was no margin for error. So they had these very strict structures in place. Part of that centered on how do you pass things from one generation to the next. These rules might seem crazy to us. They might even seem arbitrary, especially when we start reading some of the rules in the uh, Old Testament about food. But the people at the time believed these rules were necessary for the very survival of not just themselves, and their families, but their very culture, their very way of life. And these rules were very strict. And as I said, a lot of them centered around passing stuff. Wealth is too big of a word because they didn't really have much for wealth yet. But how do you pass on from one generation to the next? They had the, these rights of the firstborn. The firstborn son became the head of the household. There are no exceptions. There's no negotiations. Because fighting over inheritance put everyone at risk. Everyone knew this was the way it had to be. The firstborn son took over the family business. And that family business always centered around something to do with food. Number one, food. Safety. Security. So the problem was, though, the family we're talking about there was no agreement on that. There was no agreement on this rule. The uh, Part of the family wanted to follow the rule. Part of the family didn't want to follow the rule. So the question of who gets the inheritance, we have, uh, going way back, this is not a new problem for this family. You have Abraham and Sarah. Abraham gets this promise from God. He's going to have all these descendants, and nothing is happening. They think, well, God's plan needs help. So here, Sarah says, here's my, my servant, Hagar, have some kids with her, and then Ishmael is born, and then everything goes kind of sideways. Eventually, Sarah does have a child, that is Isaac. In his old age, Abraham sends his most trusted servant to go get a wife for Isaac from his hometown. You hear all about that in, in the first part, uh, the first sermon from this series. So that's Rebecca. Rebecca comes back. Rebecca and Isaac then have two children. Isaac wanted things to go as normal. He wanted to follow the customs. The oldest son gets everything or gets the, the lion's share and becomes the head of the household. But Rebecca had other ideas. See, Rebecca had a really difficult pregnancy, and during the pregnancy, she prayed to God as she's pregnant with these twins. And God said that in her is the birth of two nations, two sons. And one will be stronger than the other. And the elder shall serve the younger. So Genesis chapter 25, verse 23, if you want to read the exact verse. 
And then Genesis goes on to say this. When her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. We already know that. It's just restating it for us. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy mantle. So they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel. Might mean it literally, might mean a metaphor because of what comes later. So they named him Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boy, that's it, that's, that's the birth, that's their childhood. That's it. When the boys grew up is the next line. Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field. While Jacob was a quiet man living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Another warning. We cannot confuse, just as we can't confuse the world back then with the world today, because cultures and those things were so different, we can't confuse the world that Jacob was born into and the world that Jesus was born into. At the time that Jesus lived, the Jewish people had 2,000 years of tradition to shape their culture. And they had the, the stability and the structure and the order of the Roman Empire in which to live out those traditions. None of that is present in the world that Jacob is born into. Those traditions aren't created yet. They're just starting. It will be up to Jacob and Isaac and Abraham to begin the creation of those traditions. And most of them, almost all of them, don't come into existence for several hundred more years till Moses is on the scene. So they don't have their traditions. They don't have the stability of a, of a large empire that promotes safety and commerce. If you wanted to eat, you either had to grow food or hunt for food. It was a difficult life. There were no villages with markets to go to yet. Villages are, are a new thing. There's a scene in Genesis chapter 25 that brings these difficulties to light. One day when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau arrived home from the wilderness exhausted and hungry. Esau, the older brother, says to Jacob, his younger brother, I'm starving. Give me some of that red stew. This is how Esau got his other name, Edom, which means red. All right, Jacob replied, but trade me your rights as the firstborn son. Look, I'm dying of starvation, said Esau. What good is my birthright to me now? But Jacob said, first you must swear that your birthright is mine. So Esau swore an oath, thereby selling all his rights as the firstborn to his brother Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and lentil stew. Esau ate the meal, then got up and left. He showed contempt for his rights as the firstborn. I've gone fishing up in Canada a few times. For supper, we eat the fish we catch that day. If we don't catch any fish, our meals would be pretty boring because we're eating potatoes and corn or green beans because we didn't bring any any meat we didn't bring uh, something to replace the fish because that's what we're going to eat a little different for Esau in his life if he doesn't get any game he doesn't eat he's not exaggerating when he says he's starving to death he this is not Esau going out to the back 40 in November to look for a deer this is Esau going on a hunting expedition to get food for the family. And he doesn't have any. And he is starving. The word that, that he, when it says, he says, I'm starving, the word that's used there is the same word that Isaiah uses to describe a parched and dry land in the midst of a famine. Using it as a, a metaphor for the condition of Israel is how 
Isaiah is using it. But that's, that's the mental picture. You have a land that's dying for lack of rain. So it is his birthright, though. He's starving to death, but he gives up his birthright. So there's, there's really two things we have to ask here. One, why did Esau treat his birthright with contempt? His birthright is not just their stuff. It's not just running the family. His birthright as the oldest should be the promise that God has given to Abraham and Isaac. It should be Esau's next, the promise from God. He treats it with contempt. He doesn't care. Wow. Well, He's starving. He cares more about getting some food right now. The family business, that's just an add-on. The real inheritance is that promise. But then we have Jacob. Jacob cares about the promise, but he doesn't exactly have the character of a person who we want to have that promise. His actions are contrary to everything the promise stands for. The promise says the whole world's going to get a blessing. Jacob's actions say, I'm going to take what is rightfully yours. My mind goes back to Abraham. Abraham and Sarah didn't think God was fulfilling his promise, so they said, we'll take care of it. Here's Hagar. And now Jacob is saying, you know, I want God's promise. I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to take it into my own hands. That's everything we know about Jacob and Esau and their growing up in their early adult years. Years later, we are told, one day, when Isaac was old and turning blind, he called for Esau, his older son. Jacob already has Esau's birthright, but he's not fully taken his place as the elder brother. He hasn't completely usurped him yet. To, to, to complete this sort of subversion, Jacob needs his father's blessing. Last week I talked about Abraham in his old age sending Isaac, or sending his servant to find a wife for Isaac. Now it's Isaac in his old age wanting to pass it on to his son. He's sending Esau out to go hunt, to bring him some wild game. And they're going to have a, a ceremonial meal. And after the ceremonial meal, Esau is going to get his blessing from his father. It seems Isaac doesn't know about Esau selling his birthright. And, and I've often wondered with that birthright, how is Jacob going to enforce this? I, I get it, Esau swore. But Esau and Jacob, I'm not sure they're the kind of people that, that an oath is going to be binding in this situation. So how does, how does Jacob plan on enforcing his claim on the birthright as the oldest son? Their transaction wasn't public. As far as we know, it was just the two of them there and the lentil stew. Well, enter Jacob's mother, Rebecca. Rebecca has a plan to make Jacob's claim on the birthright public. So she tells Jacob, go out to our flocks and get a couple of goats and bring them to me. I'll use them to prepare your father's favorite dish. She'll be able to make them taste like wild game. But look, Jacob replied to Rebekah, my brother Esau is a hairy man and my skin is smooth. What if my father touches me? He'll see that I'm trying to trick him and then he'll curse me instead of blessing me. But his mother replied, then let the curse fall on me, my son. Just do what I tell you to do. His mother isn't worried about a curse. She remembers the word spoken to her, and she's convinced that what they're doing is God's will. So Jacob gets those goats, brings them to his mother, and then he gets dressed up in some hairy animal skins. 
while his mother is preparing the food. And then he goes in, and Isaac right away is suspicious of what's going on. This is how the scene plays out. Jacob takes the food to his father. And he says, my father, I'm here with your food. And he goes, "Uh, yes, my son. But who are you? Esau or Jacob? He, he, He believes something is up. Jacob replied, it's Esau, your firstborn. I've done as you told. Here's the wild game. Now sit up and eat quickly so you can give me the blessing. Then Isaac says, well, how did you catch the game so fast, my son? To which Jacob, claiming to be Esau, says, the Lord your God put it in my path. So now he's bringing God into the lie that he and Rebekah are telling. He says, God gave it to me. Right there, walking down the path. Drops dead right in front of me so I could feed you and get that blessing. Isaac still is like, I don't know, come closer so I can touch you and make sure that you really are Esau. So Jacob went closer to his father and Isaac touched him. The voice is Jacob's, but the hands are Esau's, Isaac said. But he did not recognize Jacob because Jacob's hands felt hairy like Esau's. So Isaac prepared to bless Jacob. But he has to ask again, are you really my son Esau? Yes, says Jacob, I am. can imagine how nervous he is having to keep saying this and keep coming up with lie upon lie to try and convince his father that he really is his brother. So Isaac says, now my son, bring me the wild game and let me eat, and then I will give you the blessing. So Jacob takes the food to his father. Isaac eats it. He gave him some wine to drink with it. And then Isaac says, please come a little closer and kiss me, my son. He's still not convinced. So Jacob went over and kissed him. And Isaac caught the smell of his clothes. He was finally convinced. And he blessed his son. And he said, ah, the smell of my son, like the smell of the outdoors, which the Lord has blessed. And this is the blessing he gave him. From the dew of heaven and the richness of earth, God will give you abundant harvest of grain and bountiful new wine. It almost sounds like he's undoing the curse placed on the ground at the time of Adam, where God talks about you'll have to toil. Now he's saying it's going to be the riches of the earth will be yours. Many nations will become your servants. They will bow down to you. You will be the master over your brother, and your mother's sons will bow down to you. All who curse you will be cursed. All who bless you will be blessed. So we have this passing over Esau with the blessing for Jacob. We saw how how Isaac took many lies to convince Isaac that it really was Esau, when in fact it was Jacob. Jacob's plan, well, Rebecca's plan that Jacob carried out was done so well. Listen to the the last line of the blessing. All who curse you will be cursed. All who bless you will be blessed. He can't take it back. This is it. You can't take it back because he just said anyone who curses you will be cursed. Jacob skedaddles out of there. No sooner had he left than Esau enters with his food. And he says, Father, it's me. And and Isaac was like, who? He says, it's me, Esau. I have your food for you like you instructed me to do. Isaac immediately realizes what's happened. He's devastated. He's been tricked by his wife and his son. And he's like, Father, give me a blessing. He said, I only had the one. That's how they believed it. It's I've got one blessing. I gave it to him and I can't take it back because I said anyone that curses him will be cursed. He says, but I have something left for you, Esau. It is this. You will live away from the richness of the earth 
and away from the dew of heaven above. You will live by your sword, and you will serve your brother. But when you decide to break free, I can't give you a blessing to break you free, but when you decide to break free, you will shake his yoke from your neck. Esau walks out of there and he's like, okay, that was a rotten blessing, but he gave me an out. When I decide to break free, I'll shake the yoke from my neck. And Esau begins to plan his brother's demise. He begins to plan killing his brother. So Rebecca has another plan. She's like, I got to get Esau out of here, or I got to get Jacob out of here. Esau is going to kill him. So she goes to Isaac and she says, I'm sick and tired of these local Hittite women. That's Esau's married a couple of them already. I would rather die than see Jacob marry one of them. Send him home. Send him back to my home. Send him back to your father's home to find a wife so he can marry one of us. That's where we are. So their whole life, Jacob and Esau are in conflict with each other. And to save his life, his mother sends him away. Let us pray. Lord God, in this, in these passages, you're hardly mentioned. Mostly you're mentioned in improper ways. Jacob wasn't loyal to you. Rebecca wasn't loyal to you. They used Esau and Isaac as their pawns. And yet, Lord, you were faithful. You kept your promise. You kept your promise to them and you keep your promises to us even when we behave like Jacob and Rebecca. And we give you thanks for that. And we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. At this time, we are going to celebrate Holy Communion. If you are watching this online and would like to participate, uh, simply pause the video and then gather together what you would need uh, for, for either wine or grape juice or drink and the bread or a cracker. So let us pray. Father in heaven, you created us in your image. When we fell, your son came to lift us up. In this meal, we not only remember what Jesus did for us, but through faith we receive the forgiveness he promises to us. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in the remembrance of me. The body of Christ broken for you. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in the remembrance of me. The blood of Christ shed for you. Now let us join together in the prayer that our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 
And now the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and preserve you from this day forth and forevermore. Amen. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, that we can relax and not worry, knowing that you are in control and that you have a plan, even when we cannot understand it. Thank you for giving us the assurance that you are our sovereign Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray about turmoil in the world. We pray that you give strength and comfort to those who live in war zones, and we pray for peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift up Christians throughout the world who are suffering persecution for their faith. We pray for missionaries who are taking huge risks for the sake of the gospel. Strengthen and protect them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the United States and our elected leaders. Keep us strong and humble as a country. We pray for those who risk their safety to keep us safe, including law enforcement officers, firefighters, and those who serve us in the military. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are sick in mind, body, or emotions and we ask that you touch them with your healing and your peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you for the strength we feel being with other believers here at church. Use this upcoming week for us to serve others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please join with me in our closing prayer. Lord, we pray that our time here will bless and guide us in the week to come. Plant your word deep in our hearts so that it will be a path before us, leading us to walk in your way so that we are a blessing to those around us. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my turn Till I met you I was breathing but not Alive. All my failures I try to hide. It was my turn till I met.
give your glory I needed shelter I was an orphan Now you call me a citizen of heaven Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.